Are you part of a nonprofit organization, a youth group looking to raise cash for your cause? Stay tuned at the end of this video to learn how you can bring the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation to your town live, featuring the superstars and legends of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Portland. On Saturday, August 31st, feel the thrill of WWE Live. The age of Rollins is here. And we are going to burn it down. See Seth Rollins collide with Baron Corbin for the Universal Championship. Plus, Becky Lynch takes on Lacey Evans for the Raw Women's Championship. And don't miss AJ Styles and Braun Strowman. It's WWE Live on Saturday, August 31st. Tickets and WWE Superstar Experience packages are available. <laughs> This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Around the corner, around the world, I'm Dan Marotti, joined by this all-star panel, including... Mr. USA, Tony Atlas, WWE Hall of Famer. ESPN and Fightful's Matt Degnan. Unbelievable. What a team we have here, Tony. I'm telling you, I think I'm going to be like old Yeller. I'm going to be out the door. Yep. All right, it is a sad day in professional wrestling. It is the 31st anniversary of the death of Bruiser Brody, who was murdered in a Puerto Rican locker room in 1988. Tony Atlas witnessed this murder firsthand. We have gone through what you saw, uh, what went down that day at the arena, at the hospital, at the hotels. There's many episodes we have uh, covered this on, and Viceland is a great special on it now. I'm sure you can look up online as well. Check out our episodes if you haven't. It's some great content. What we did was, Tony, where I know you are big on fan feedback, fan responses, we have gone through the most recent video we did on Viceland and the fans gave uh, some certain critiques. He's going to run them down to you, but one, I'm going to have to read this to you. The fans said, read this to Tony Atlas. He's, we know he doesn't use the internet much, but Dutch Mantel, uh, Zeb Coulter, made a, a written uh, blog, I guess you may call, a couple of years back. Uh, you might have a thought, you might have a comment, so I'm going to actually read to you mm -hmm. what Dutch said. This is what Dutch Mantel wrote now. It is already known that Jose Gonzalez was the man that stabbed and killed Bruiser Brody. He pleaded self-defense, and partly due to a weak justice system in Puerto Rico, and partly due to the fact that nobody was at Gonzalez's trial on behalf of Brody, Gonzalez was acquitted. The controversy surrounds why the men that were never subpoenaed never got to Puerto Rico to testify. Yes, it is true to entertain... Fuck, I fucked that up. Let me start it again. It is already known that Jose Gonzalez was the man that stabbed and killed Bruiser Brody. He pleaded self-defense, and partly due to a weak justice system in Puerto Rico, and partly due to the fact that nobody was at the Gonzalez trial on behalf of Brody, Gonzalez was acquitted. The controversy surrounds why the men that were subpoenaed never got to Puerto Rico to testify. Yes, it is true that certain wrestlers would not talk, but there were many who were very willing to talk. Unfortunately, they never got their chance. I arrived in Puerto Rico for a two-day run on a Saturday afternoon. After deplaning and collecting my bags, I made my way to the Lagoon El Canario, where I would be staying. The El Canario was a great hotel by Puerto Rican standards because they had cable with a remote and in room air conditioning. That was a luxury. I met Bruiser in the lo lobby of the hotel where we were to meet Tony Atlas. Bruiser told me that Tony had arranged a ride for the three of us with a guy who opened a local gym and was a big wrestling fan. After a few minutes, Atlas arrived and we departed for uh, Bayamon Lobrel Stadium around 6 p.m. The trip takes about 20 minutes, so we were very early for the show. Everything was fine, just small talk made in the car on the way over. We collected our bags from the trunk upon arrival and entered the stadium, heading for the dressing room. But as we entered the dressing room, I felt tension in the air. 
I always felt tension in there, is it's extremely dangerous place to work. But that night it was really heavy. Don't ask me why, I don't even know. I just felt it. As I entered, I was following Brody, and I noticed Carlos Colon, an invader, Jose Gonzalez, sitting on a bench to my right. Invader was trying on his leather strap that he wears on his arm with his teeth. Neither man spoke. Thinking back on it now, I don't believe any acknowledgement was made to Brody either. I followed Brody to the rear of the locker room, directly in front of the shower door. There were other guys who were already there. The Young Bloods, TNT, Roberto Soto, and Castillo Jr. were in various stages of unpacking and getting ready. I've always hated dressing rooms, so I sat down briefly, still feeling uneasy about the tension that I felt, decided to check the crowd. That was a ritual with me. I always got out to check the crowd or arena when I got there, just to familiarize myself with it. Bayamon Stadium is a baseball stadium, so I arose from my chair and headed through the tunnel to get to the field. It's about 100 feet through the tunnel, and I stood, watching the crowd file in for no more than three minutes, and I had not been gone from the dressing room for longer than five or six minutes at the most. When I returned, my eyes were met with horror. The whole dressing room was chaotic. The first person I saw was Chris Youngblood. I asked him what had happened. He was almost hysterical as he said, Jose stabbed Brody. I still did not know what he meant, but as I looked deeper in the room, I saw Brody laying prone with several guys surrounding him. I thought that some guy named Jose had rushed into the locker room and attacked Brody. Everybody in Puerto Rico is named Jose. <laughs> so I looked at Chris again, and he said, Invader. Invader stabbed Brody. It was Bedlam in the dressing room. Now, everything started to move in slow motion. I remember walking over to where Brody was laying and just staring in disbelief. A doctor was always present in San Juan, and he was crying. Brody was conscious, but as I looked closer, I could see a stab wound about an inch long with deep air bubbles escaping from it. Much later, the doctor told me that meant the blade had pierced the lung. Brody was telling promoter Carlos Colon to take care of his family. I didn't see a lot of blood, but again, later I learned that he was hemorrhaging internally. I believed that Bruiser knew he was going to die. This can't be happening, I thought to myself. This can't be real, but it was real. I may not be a very religious person, but I eased over in a corner out of everyone's way and prayed for Brody. I then found myself looking through a plexiglass door which led into the shower. The door was kind of translucent plexiglass that disordered images somewhat, but I saw Invader and Victor Jovica screaming at each other in the shower. Noise was everywhere, and I couldn't make out what they were saying, but even if I couldn't have heard them, they were speaking in Spanish, which they often do, but I could see that there was a struggle in process. Invader and Jovica were shoving each other, it seemed as though Invader was attempting to leave and Jovica was trying to stop him. Brody was still on the floor. The doctor was working furiously to do what he could to help him. A call went out for an ambulance. It seemed most like an eternity before aid arrived. And they didn't even get the call through the official channels. Victor Quinones called a local radio station and told them to broadcast that an ambulance was needed at the stadium. A paramedic crew was eating at a nearby McDonald's and heard the request on the radio. Brody, by the time the paramedics arrived, had laid there for over 25 minutes. Atlas was, in a, Atlas was in a state of shock, as were the rest of us. While the paramedics were preparing Brody to take him to the emergency room, I witnessed Invader leave the shower, walk around the feet of Brody, grab his car keys, and leave. Finally, after what seemed like eternity, Brody was loaded onto the gurney to be taken out. Brody, by this time, had been down at least 40 minutes. The paramedics couldn't lift him, I saw Tony Atlas, almost by himself, carry Brody up four or five steps and transport him to the ambulance. Tony went with Brody to the hospital. At that point, nobody knew what to say or even what had happened. But I knew enough to stand back and observe the situation. Puerto Ricans basically didn't like the American boys coming down there and taking their money that they felt was rightfully theirs. And since it, I was in the dark as to what happened, I was watching to see what would happen next. Chris Youngblood told me the invader had approached Brody and requested that he accompany him to the shower to talk business. He said that invader's hand was covered with a towel. Then he said he heard screaming, a commotion inside the shower, and then seeing Brody stumble through the door, holding his chest. Brody went down. He didn't collapse, but went down under his own control. That was just before I got back into the room. The guys in the dressing room knew that something had happened and were kept in the dark as to what it was. Atlas, by this time, 
had returned to the stadium and kept saying that Brody was going to die. I told Tony to stop saying that. I didn't say that. I told Tony to stop saying that, but Tony by this time was completely out of control. The whole situation was out of control. Some police officers entered the room and Tony began to tell them what happened, but they couldn't understand English. Strange thing about it, though, they didn't take it seriously. They would smile and mutter to each other because they just thought it was a wild Puerto Rican angle. Time moved slow. Atlas was screaming by now. He was screaming at the cops who weren't understanding a thing he was saying. He was trying to list an interpreter to tell them what happened. And the invader reappeared. Nobody knew where he had gone, but I surmised that he went home because he came back with a different shirt on. He came right back as though nothing had happened and started conducting business as usual. He completely ignored Atlas, who looked wild by now. Atlas pleaded with several Puerto Rican boys to translate, but they'd look at Invader and walk away. Finally, Roberto Soto said he'd interpret. It was to no avail. These cops grew up watching Carlos Invader, so to them, they were big stars and they were just ordinary policemen. You know, I was la excuse me. I was on last that night, and Atlas left the stadium and headed for the hospital that Brody had been taken to. El Medico Centro was the name of it, and somebody had told me that it was the best medical facility on the island. As we were talking, as we were walking into the hospital, I met the surgeon who had already operated on Brody. I asked him about Brody's status, and he just looked at me and said it was touch and go. Brody never left the operating room. They actually performed two surgeries that night. I always believed that if Brody had been in an American hospital, he would still be alive. What Brody actually died from was loss of blood. He literally bled to death on the table during the second operation. When I got back to my hotel room, I told the desk clerk that if any calls came in for Brody, direct them to my room. I couldn't sleep. I was staying with one of the midgets, the Irish leprechaun. The phone rang. The little guy answered the phone and told me it was Brody's wife. I looked at my watch. It was 5 a.m. How would I say this without causing undue panic? I calmly explained to her that Frank had been in an accident and she should get to Puerto Rico as quickly as she could. I told her that it was serious, but I thought he'd be all right. I hung up the phone. Again, I looked at my watch. It was 5.20 a.m. Brody dies at 5.40 a.m. After the call, I could not sleep. I tossed and turned, just got up. I went down to the front desk around 7.30 a.m., and the girl on duty was an American from Chicago who spoke Spanish. I asked her to call the hospital and find out what room Brody was in. That's when I found out he was dead. No words can describe how I felt. The girl at the front desk got all teary-eyed. She told me she was sorry. I just went outside the hotel and sat down for a while. How could this happen? While I was sitting there, Buddy Landell came over and asked how Brody was. It was all I could do to tell him, and he said, cut the BS. I guess he could tell by the look in my eye that I wasn't kidding. We were supposed to go to... Maya Guez that afternoon, but I never even packed my bag. I knew I wasn't going. Miguelito Perez came to pick me up, but I told him the news. He refused to go, too. Most of the Puerto Rican guys didn't hear the news until they got to town that afternoon. But after they heard of Brody's death, they refused to go to the ring. I heard that it was a sold-out $25,000 house. They sent the fans home telling them they could use the tickets the next week. I don't believe they told them the real reason why. Later that afternoon, we were all in Atlas's room. Present at the time was Atlas, myself, Spivey, Jaggers, Ron Starr, and Dan Crawford. I had been waiting all day for someone to contact me, but nothing seemed to be happening. I later learned that the WWC office was stonewalling information on the wrestlers' whereabouts. Atlas stated that we had to tell somebody. I then remembered the names of the detectives that the girl at the front desk had given me when she made the call to the hospital that morning. Orlando Figueroa. Pedro Clanero, and Hector Quinones. Atlas talked to one of the detectives on the phone and told them where they were. The detective said they'd be right over, and they were in about 10 minutes. That's a lie. They came into the room, asked a few questions, and then transported Atlas to headquarters. Tony left the hotel around 5 p.m. He did not return until 10 p.m. I started to get worried about him, but when he came back, he told them that they wanted to talk to me. Of course, I agreed. The station looked like it was something you'd expect to find in El Salvador, hot and stinking, with no air conditioning and a big overhead fan. I told them what I had seen and afterwards signed a <clears throat> sworn deposition as to my testimony. I could only swear as to what I actually saw, but I did my part. As I was leaving, I saw TNT and Miguelito Perez there. I didn't ask any questions, and they did not ask me any either. So I don't know what their statement said. I was told by the detectives that Jose Gonzalez would be charged with first-degree murder 
and advised me that when the time for the trial came, I would be subpoenaed and transported back to Puerto Rico to testify. They told me that the airfare and hotel would be arranged for me and that security would be provided. That's what they said. However, that's not what they did. I was depressed when I left Puerto Rico and even more so when I got back to Birmingham. If you've ever been to Birmingham, you know what I mean. I told my wife in detail everything that happened. She told me that nothing would be done to Jose Gonzalez. I got mad at her. How could something not be done? I told her to wait and see. I waited, and I saw she was right. I got two subpoenas for the trial. The first trial date was postponed. The second trial was scheduled for January 23rd through 26th, 1989. I still have the subpoena. It was issued January 3rd, 1989, but according to the post date, it was not mailed until January 13th, 1989. That meant that it laid on someone's desk for a full 10 days. Remember, the trial was to, supposed to start on January 23rd. I received the subpoena on January 24th. I had already heard the verdict by the time I opened the subpoena. I never heard from the detectives again, not even to this day. Your thoughts about that, Tony? I could see you thinking as I was reading that long blog. Abdullah the Room, Abdullah the Butcher, is where the meeting was at. Mm -hmm. The policeman spoke English. I worked out with the policeman in the gym. The guy that ran the gym spoke English. Roberta Soda spoke English. There was no problem finding somebody. Uh, uh, Manuel sp spoke English. You know all this. You know that. I, if, I remember you know these okay. people. Sure. Fabio yes, Vegas, TNT yep. speak English. Yep. You know that. I know that. All right. Number two, you asked Barbara. She said one, one American came to the police station. One, not two. So you they don't think one, Judge ever went to the police? No, really? According to, according to Barbara. All right. I was there. Seeker. Walked with me. The police never came to the hotel. It was at, it was at the Tanama. They never came to the hotel. Never. Abdullah said somebody should go report it. I said I'm going, but I don't want to go by myself. Seeker, Raymond Rome's father. Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns' father told me, I go with you, brother. And anybody know Seeker back in them days, you couldn't have a brother protector. Me and Seeker went. We walked there. Nobody came and got us. No police came to no hotel. So do you think he just remembers it wrong? Maybe. I don't know. I, I don't know, but that ain't what happened there. You know, some of what he said is, is true. They did not have a ride arranged with me. He was supposed to ride with Jose. You said he was stranded. Right. Jose didn't show up. And then I told him he could go with us. Me and Dutch sat in the back. Brody sat up front. The guy girlfriend sat in the center. That's what happened. Then when the, when the ambulance came there, he didn't go within 10 feet of Brody. Nobody did. Dutch Mantel? Nobody did. Just no, you? I'm on one. Brody came to me. They said, brother, they, I'm hurt. Don't let them hurt me anymore. Don't let them. He didn't say Jose, him. He said them. I pulled him out of the shower. I laid him down. I picked him up, put him in the ambulance. I went to the hospital with him. I went to the police station. Nobody lifted a freaking finger. Nobody. And I would say that. To my dying day, nobody made a move. No one. They didn't do shit. Nobody went to the hospital to see Brody. That's a lie. Dutch didn't go. Nobody went to the hospital to see no Brody. Out there by myself. I took a Puerto Rican guy with me to help me translate. And he didn't want to go. You made him. You, you, his, the guy's father, you named the guy in there. The guy's father? Yeah, his son. You call it Perez? Oh, uh, Megalito Perez? Yeah, Perez. That yeah. was the son, the young one. His father went with me. All right. His father got shot a week later in the back. Really? He was in a wheelchair a week later. Really? For going to the hospital with me. Sure did. You, yeah. you think he got 
I don't Miguel know. Perez I was Senior gone. got shot. He got a shot week after a the week after the murder. Brody got shot in the back twice. Were paralyzed from the late And down. you think it was in retaliation? I don't know what. It, I I'm not thinking. I'm just saying what happened. I'm trying to give facts, not opinion. All right. Nobody, nobody made a move. I said it on Vice. All right. Well, let's, I've been saying that ever since it happened. Nobody made a move. The fans, some fans, everybody want to act like they did something. Nobody did not. Nobody made a move. Other than nobody. you. Nobody. Other than you. Nobody. All right, Tony. I, I said it a hundred times. Nobody made a move towards Brody. If Brody was here right now, he would tell you the same thing. Nobody came within 10 feet of him. The only person that came near Brody was I was standing there, and I wouldn't let nobody come there. I know nobody came there. If Dutch had walked over, I would have punched him out. He would have, he would have, he would have hit the floor. You were his protector. I was, I would not, because I, I didn't know who was not involved. If Dutch was very much involved with the company, him and Abdullah, the, the last person I would have let near that man that day would be him or anybody involved with that office. Mm -hmm. And Brody tugged at my leg and told me to let Carlos over. Carlos came over and said, Brody, anything I can do for you? Brody said, yes, take care of my family. And that Carlos was the only person. So do you think Carlos knew what was going to happen? I'm, I'm telling you, I want to give facts. Okay. Carlos, because that's how things get messed up. All People right. start giving their opinion instead of sticking to what really happened. And then that's the only person that went anywhere near Brody other than me and the paramedics. Because he called them over. Brody wanted to talk to him, to tell him to so take you care of his family. Him. You allowed him. Yeah. yeah. Carlo was the only person I let come near Brody, and that's the honor God truth. And I swear on the stock of Bible, everything I say. I and believe you, it. And you watch Vice TV, and I said it a thousand times. Nobody. The matches went on. And the policeman did speak English. He asked me. He said, Tony, what happened? I said, that cocksucker right there stabbed him. He said, you mean Vader? That's what the cop said. You mean Vader? I said, yes, that's some of the bits right there. That, that's how they found out. And he said, well, that's strange. I said, what's strange about it? He said, everybody, the cops say this, everybody say that a wrestling fan did it. All right, well, let's check out some of the fan feedback, some of the fans' response to our last episode about this, Tony. Very interesting uh, across the board. I've been, I've been reading them, and some of them are pretty interesting. The first one says, Tony, you were Brody's angel. I'm glad he had you during that dark time in his life. I felt the truth listening to your perspective. This was a complete setup. Those responsible will have their day. That's right. He's right. That one's right. That's, the, that's what happened. And this one says, what's up with all these old school wrestlers and fanny packs, LOL? Forget about it. Okay. If Abdullah owned a piece of the company, why would he have a meeting in his hotel room? If it's a boycott, he isn't making any money for his company. No. I haven't watched the Vice documentary yet, but is it mentioned that Brody came through the surgery and died the next morning? Tony Atlas wasn't lying when he said the ER doc came out of surgery and said they had him stabilized. He did. Uh, he was stabbed early afternoon, sometime between 4 and 7 a.m., mm -hmm. which we said here. Mm -hmm. Carlos Colon and two unidentified people came to visit Brody's room, and he died shortly thereafter. Do you have any idea who the un two unidentified people I, were? I left. Today? They waited for me to leave. The guy told me about two seconds after I walked out the door, they came in. Two Colon? seconds. They were waiting for me to. They were waiting for me to leave. Carlos and these two other men. They were waiting for me to leave. Mm -hmm. That's why the bigger regret I have with that whole thing was leaving. I should have never leaving. left. I should have never left. Should have never left. I regret that today. I should have never left. I was his only protector. I've seen the documentary numerous times since its premiere, and not one single time does anyone ever mention that Brody's widow was confronted by the local police, telling her that only one person ever came Thank forward. Thank you. Thank you. To provide an eyewitness. Thank account. you. One. One. Keep reading, kid. So I personally don't know how true that remark uh, by Tony is, and I'm not saying Tony is lying, only that it wasn't mentioned in the documentary. She may have been told that, and it wasn't long before. The police additionally interviewed the other wrestlers, as Dutch says. So I won't say Dutch is lying about being interviewed either, as that's been his story from the get-go. Also, the officer who is alleged to have Brody's widow may have been misinformed, too. Mm-hmm. See? One. Uh, that's that, what she told me. And then the next She told me herself. She said they told her one person came down. And the only one that went down with me and Seeker, I didn't see nobody else walk down there with me. 
with just me and Sika. That was it. And Sika was in that other dress room. So Sika said, well, I, he said, I don't know what happened. And he didn't because he was in the heel baby uh, dress room. Nobody went down there, man. Mm -hmm. The next one says, Dutch Mantel is a no good piece of shit. Very. He said, who is? Uh, Dutch Mantel is a no good piece of shit. Uh, if Atlas wasn't there, nobody would know about this murder. Exactly. All the other wrestlers are present, including Dutch, um, told police a wrestling fan had stabbed Brody. That's right. That's the uh, proof. The next one is in all caps. Out of all the stories about the death of Bruiser Brody, nobody has asked the real question about this whole tragic incident. Why nobody had asked the police, officers, lawyers, etc. Why Jose Gonzalez would have a nine-inch knife in a wrestling locker room. It seems to me that they all had the intention in the world to kill him. He had two eight-inch cut, not one inch. If he had went over there and saw it, he would have known it was not one inch. Eight inches, brother. His intestine was hanging out almost. How are they going to be in one inch? The next one says, I, I say put... They're about trying to cover their ass, what they're doing. Trying to make themselves look like the heroes when they wasn't. Happens. Chicken shit bitches. <laughs> the next one Keep says... Keep on, kid. I'm sorry. It's all right. The next one says, I say put Jose Gonzalez in the ring with Tony for five minutes. No holds barred. I'd uh, pay to see that as Tony beats his ass. I would love to. Uh, the next one says, all wrestlers are whores because they still went back to the um, Puerto Rico. And one became the booker. Uh, Abby is just afraid to say anything, even in his old ass, you know that. immobile state. Uh, he'll miss a Puerto Rican payday. Abby is a piece of garbage, so cheap he won't even fix his teeth. Thank you. <laughs> and then the last one says, Dutch is a lying sack of shit. Mr. USA speaks the truth. Fuck Dutch. That was some of the fan response to the episode we did, Tony. Because people know what... If, if, if what they said, when they was there to help him out and did all that stuff, how come none of them went to the hospital with him? Yeah. They know the time of day. Well, it was 31 years ago they today. They wrestled, and, and, and you know who were the last match? Me and the Sheik, Ask the Sheik. I you told me. that. I didn't know that one on last, but I knew me who and you Sheik, because if Carlo didn't, if Carlo put, pushed Ahmed towards him, waiting for me to come back. He didn't know if I was going to come back or not. So he had the sheep at the last match. I got match. you. So we pushed you on later in the right. show. Right. We was you. pushed all the way to the end. So it's supposed to have been Brody's was supposed to be the main event. No, see, everybody tried to make themselves look like that they was really, really concerned. Believe me, brother, when, when, when they asked them, say, that they couldn't lift him. And they said, can, can we get some help lifting him? Everybody did this. Why wouldn't the boys help load him onto the ambulance? I don't because get that. The, because they did they think they didn't get nobody heat? want to get involved. Yeah. I was too stupid. <laughs> well, I don't know. If, I think you were. Well, that's just how I being. was. That's how just I was nice. in them days. I, I was just that type of person, man. You know, I was six two, two hundred and ninety pound, with a six fifty bench, and could drop kick you with both feet in the face, and had twenty six boxing matches and one loss out of twenty six. And was four years state collegiate champion. I didn't fear nobody. Now that again, thirty-one years. That's after, why I did it. I didn't fear nobody. Thirty-one years after the fact, Tony, does this continue to haunt you? You listen. Stick in your you mind? listen to every time I would tell this story. Mm -hmm. It never changed. Never. My mama said, "A lie. Every time you tell it, it's gonna come out different. But the truth comes out every time you tell it." He was not arranged to ride with me. He was supposed to went with Jose to the show. And, me, and I was drawing the picture of the young blood, and Brody asked me to do a picture of his son. And when he died, when he went to the hospital, he had that picture in his hand. When I loaded him on the ambulance, that picture was in the hand. When they took him in the operating room, that picture was in the hand. He was holding his intestines in with one hand and holding his son's picture with the other hand. Never forget that. And, I, and they couldn't go to my room because Savio Vega asked him, told me not to go to my room because they're looking for You've me because I was talking. Yeah. It was in Abdullah's room. Yeah. Abdullah got the, what, the one to find out the boy was going to work. He, went, he wanted to find out that it, uh, picked the boy's brain so he could report back to Carlos what's going on. Who is that now? Abdullah. Oh, you think that's what happened? He don't pay five percent of the company. You think he snitched on you guys? He just wanted to know what was going on. That's how they knew I went to the police station. How he, how Carlos know he wasn't there? He wasn't at the meeting. How you know I went to the station? Yeah, true point. Who told him? Wow. 
Well, how often do you think about it, Tony, outside of an interview like this? When you're at home, does it ever no, pop into no, your head? No, this is what it taught me. What did it teach you? Klondike Bill told me, say, kid, when you finish this business, if you have one friend, one, consider yourself lucky. People always think wrestlers are friends. They are business associates. When I first want to write my book, instead of putting too much too soon, Scott Teal, the guy that write the book, he liked that book. I want to call it Ship of Parrots. Ship the, what? The cutthroat oh. parrot. You know, cutthroat. Because they all cut each other's throat. When you leave the company, it's like you were never there. When I was homeless, I knew more millionaires than Rockefeller. Paul Lee Dangerly, I saved his life one day in Gleason Gym. He thought he'd get an old man Gleason some shit. He told him, take him upstairs, throw him off the freaking roof. I went upstairs and stopped him. He said, oh, yeah, Tony, when I start my company, I'm going to make sure you be part of it. I want you to, to manage the, the, the public enemy. Never did nothing for me. When did that happen? I got in trouble with Huck Hogan with Vince Sr. every time I fought him. They want me to beat him in five minutes. I said, they're going to make the guy look bad. I used to go 15 minutes with him. Do all type of stuff. Never did nothing for me. So a lot of people in the business I help never did nothing for me when I fell flat on my, on, on my face. Wrestlers are not friends. Never have been. They would cut your throat. I talked to Ronnie Piper one time. I said, Piper, who are we going to talk about tonight? When I say talk about, I don't mean not in a good way. He said, whoever is not in the dressing room. Sure enough, that's what they were talking about. The guy wasn't there to defend himself. Right. They always, some people have reached the top by their own merits. Other people have reached the top by blowing out other people's candles. And like there, by blowing out other people's candles. You know, everybody was a freaking stooge. If Vince come to anybody, ask them anything. That's why Mark Henry, when I first wrote me, he said, Tony, what we, what's in the car stays in the car. That's why Mark liked me, because he never hear any conversation outside of the car that we had. When I he got trusted out there, you. Because I kept, I didn't do that to him. I didn't backstab him. Wrestlers are the bunch of backstabbers. That's why you go to the WWE locker room now and want nobody to talk to nobody. Captain Ruel Alabama would stooge on you in front of everybody. Vince, everybody in the dressing room laughing and joking. He come in, hey, that Tony Anthony boy, I wonder if he could walk today. He was doing so much dope last night. He was so drunk last night. He was doing this. He telling me everything I did. And Vince is standing right there. But he's doing it in a joking manner, like he's joking. But in that all was reality, he was trying to stick it to yeah, I got you. Yeah. I got you know, you. Chief J. Strongboat, God rest his soul, was my only friend agent there. He told me that Jaws the Animal Steel used to cut my throat. Gorilla Monsoon used to cut my throat. He told me about all of them. And you don't like George Steele? Well, I don't dislike him because I'm a Christian. I don't dislike anyone. God said to love thy enemy. Vengeance is man, said the Lord. Judge not yet ye be judged. And I believe in God. So it's not my place to judge him. It's not my place to criticize him. That's not my place. That's God's place. And I'm not going to try to do his job for him. My job is to forgive and forget. And that's what I do. I forgive them, then I forget. Then I forgive myself if I got angry or respond in any type of negative way. But when the Brody was on that floor, there was nobody there but me. And he would be alive today, I hate to say it, if I had never left the hospital. Because, what do you think happened because, in the hospital? Well, the guy told me, the, the next day, a buddy of mine, because all of them knew me from the gym. Everybody yeah. I talked to are gym yeah. people, gym people. And they all spoke English. They said, Tony, I'm sorry what happened to your buddy lad. I said, oh, I said, the guy, I said, why did the doctor tell me he was stable when he not? He said, he were. He said, two people came in with security suits on and told him, stop working on the wrestler. You think that's what happened? They just said stop working on him? Mm -hmm. So you don't think he was killed or anything? I think they went there and finished the job. Yes, I do. Oh. They waited for me. They, he said two seconds, less than a minute after I left. They went in. And I didn't see them going out. Wow. You understand? They were sitting somewhere They were hiding me. somewhere. They, they would have had me. to have been hiding. They were watching me. Wow. They wanted him dead. 
do you feel lucky that nothing happened to you? No. No. I wanted them to come out to me. Oh, you don't know me back in them days, brother. Yeah. I was a rugged SOB, brother. If they had a gun, though, I, I, I don't know how much of a man you would have been for brother, the gun. Brother, brother, brother. One guy, I was in a, a bar, uh, uh, my, my uh, apartment in Georgia, mm -hmm. and a guy pulled a gun on me. You know what I did? I threw the refrigerator at him. <laughs> you threw the refrigerator at him? In my day, I, I was able to pick up a refrigerator and throw it, yeah. I would I pick up a that. heavy, I could pick up, pick up a heavy, I had a deadlift of 800 pound, of, uh, 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 800 pound squat and a 650 bench and military press 420. Wow. I could take 420 pounds like this and put them in my head. I got a picture of me pressing a 460 pound man, Bundy. Hogan was 340. If you was under 300, I wouldn't press slam you. It wasn't impressive. It wasn't impressive. All right, Tony. And, I, and I was fat. Just like... Just like in my day, if somebody come here with a gun, the first thing I do is grab this chair and throw it at him. I would throw heavy things at you. That's why nobody wanted to fight me. I took a small refrigerator out of the room, they bought that hat. I grabbed that refrigerator and threw it at him. Pulled his gun out to me and said, Yeah, what you gonna do against this? I grabbed that refrigerator out of my hotel room and threw it at him. What do you do after that? He ran out the door. He ain't back with me. <laughs> Thought you were nuts. I had to pay for the, I had to pay, pay for the door, though, because the refrigerator stuck in the door. Well. You know the refrigerator they have yeah, in no, a, I know what you That's mean. what I would do. That, that's how I used to fight people. I'd pick up something big and throw it at them. Wow. That's well, how I used you to were fight. like the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, 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 I was green, strong, though, brother. So. I was hey, very you green. strong. You don't have to sell me on that. But I, Tony I was strong as hell, and I was quick. Vince, you watch all the tape. Vince said that Tony Atlas moved like a cat. I could drop kick you. I drop kicked John Studd one time and missed him. Really? I went you over his too head. High? No, I went. We got Why? too high. Too high. Yeah. Wow, shit. Yeah, missed him. Right. right over his fucking head. Tony, it is it is important to <laughs> me to remember the Brody incident every year. I wish he was. Now with I'm not knocking Dutch. Maybe he did go. Maybe. Maybe later. Maybe. But not during the time I was there. Well, I've only known Dutch Barbara to be a stand-up guy. Where Barbara, so. where Barbara said is in there. Barbara said. One. 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 All right. Well, I think every July, Tony, I think Brody and should if be you could, right, I think the best, the best way to find <laughs> out is to, is, to get the, is to contact, see if you get the files on that case mm -hmm. and see who made a report. You know what? Maybe, you know what, for next, since I like to make this an annual get thing. Get the facts. Maybe we should get the report. Get the report. You know what? This may be your homework assignment. Get the report. I'm a busy guy. And I guarantee you. Well, I'm not ESPN and and, and I guarantee you, the only name that the, the, the police, the, the barber told me on the phone mm -hmm. when I talked to her, when they're doing the thing with Vice, she said, I told her what I did. She said, Yeah, they told me that one of the Americans came to talk. She said, One. That's what she said. I ain't knocking what nobody All else right. said. I can only tell you what I did and what I know. And I know that the doctor came out and told me Brody was stable. But he wanted me to leave because I was disrupting everything. You were loud. No, I was no? snatching people, telling them to go do something. I picked that doctor up and told his ass. I him. remember you told me that, yeah. Uh, yeah, he told me. Because the stab in Puerto Rico was like a, a cough in America. It was no big deal. The doctor opened the door and showed me all these stab victims. He said, oh, we got a lot of people that have been stabbed. That's not a big deal. He's going to be okay. Shut the door. I said, no, he been, he's been stabbed. Don't you understand what I'm saying? He said, oh, we get to him. He turned to walk away. I grab him by his waist, pick him up like this on my shoulder. And I took him to Brody and set him down right in front of Brody. And Brody had his hand like this and had a picture of his baby, of his boy, like, like this in the fist. And the doctor lifted his hand. It was a pool of blood. It was no blood. internal bleeding. Two eight inch cut, like this, not like that, like this. This man belly was hanging over, brother. All right, well, fans, uh, certainly a somber they day. They cut his, they, they cut his intestines right. and his liver. His liver was cut halfway in two. Wow. Well, you'll never forget it, Tony, and I no. don't think anyone should ever forget Bruiser. No, Brady. I know He's every, in, that... I know every inch of it. I never forgot one. Detail. How not, could you? Something How like that. You? Right. You can't really forget. He was about as far from here to that camera from me. Uh, well. About as far from here to where you at when he got stabbed. Wow. 
All right, wrestling fans, again, we can only try and remember Bruiser Brody, the legend that he was, the despicable way that his life ended because of scumbags in Puerto Rico and some of the people that maybe helped cover it up in the end. Again, maybe Jose Gonzalez will meet his fate in a different way. Uh, we just want to send special thanks to all the people that make this show happen. If it wasn't for the And I want all you people to go out there and go to your local comics month and, and have Barbara what? to file your local comic book or whoever, because this is international stuff, and your local comic book, your local representative, and tell them that you want Barbara Goodish to, to charge Jose with a wrongful death and retry him in Texas. Just like what happened with Snooker, right? Same there thing. You go. I want to thank our hardworking crew. We got Walter Hillside up in the control booth. We have our main man, Joe Swamps, get behind the scenes here today, given all of his time to help make this show a reality. We had help from little Connor Smith, the puppet, Cecil the Lion, uh, the professor Mike Miner helped with the lights to make us look so beautiful. Yeah. And I one can, more what, thing, what, what? I hate all to right. interrupt, one more thing. All right. Anybody that don't believe what I do, and I don't have a lot of money, but if there's anybody out there that's reeling, to give me a live detective test right here on Boston Wrestling. You'll do That'd the live be the detective way to get test. to the truth. I would do a live detective test right here. I wish that I could get on, uh, I watch his program all the time. He got the best in the Dr. world. Dr. Phil? No, uh, he got the best uh, live detective thing in the world there. Uh, Tom Mori. Steve uh, Wilco. Steve Wilco? Oh. Steve Wilco. He used to be Jerry Springer's body. No guy. matter what it was, right. he got right. the right. he got the <laughs> number one the number one guy. He's that, good. I think Maury he's does lie very detectors good. as well. He does too. Yeah. They're, they're good. So if anybody know how to get me on the Steve Walker show, is well, that we'll send him a video. Wilkos. Yeah. yeah. To uh, have send them him put invite. me put me on a live detective machine and have me to tell my story and then put some of the other ones on there. Have them tell their story. Larry Shreve. Let them tell their story. Um, all these stories should be told on a live detective thing. Maybe That's we should, how you get to the maybe truth. Maybe the hell with it, Tony. Maybe we should invite all these people to the studio and we can do They it. could lie. We can get a live they detective that, that, down here. If, 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 if you get a person and put them on a live, but you have to have a little Some of these things are good and some are not. Mm -hmm. You had to get a replica person to do it. Yeah. Because, because if you, don't want, you don't want no doubt. The only person that I would do a live detective with is Steve Wilkos. He's the only person in the world is Steve Wilkos. Well, because he got the number one guy. All right. All right. That's fine, then. We the need guy him. that does it, do it for the FBI. He do it for everybody. He's the top guy. You want to expose Shreve and some of these other people. Yeah, he's the right. top guy. Why would I go to somebody, go to a student when I can learn from the teacher? There you Why go. would I learn from the player when I can learn from the coach? Exactly. All right. Well, I want the coach. I don't want the student. I don't, don't want the freshman. I think the fans around the world that watch this program. Certainly. All they got to do is call that Steve Walker. He put me on the show. It ain't going to cost him nothing. They're very grateful to you to be able to share from your heart and even your soul sometimes. Yes. You're put a good me on human Steve being. Walker. Steve, if you're out there watching Boston Rats, you bring me to your show. I tell them about Brody. All right. Well. That way you know it's the truth. Steve's show is good. You like Steve. I love it. All right, wrestling fans, you heard it from the Hall of Famer himself, Tony Atlas, our good friend here, the, the prodigy, Matt Degman. I'm Dan Marotti. Until we speak again, folks, you and yours, be well. Giddy up. I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm John Cena Sr. Let us tell you how the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation can help raise cash for your nonprofit cause. Experience the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation live in your city throughout New England, the tri-state area, down through the Carolinas, out to our friends in the Midwest and beyond. If your nonprofit organization is looking for an interactive turnkey experience while putting the fun into fundraising, You've met the perfect tag team partner to work with every step of the way. The MWF offers a variety of packages for groups of almost any size, from our live events at the Boston Garden, the Kowloon Entertainment Dining Complex, and the legendary Suffolk Downs, to high school gyms and function halls. We've presented live events everywhere and anywhere. Since 2001, the MWF mission has been simple. Keep the kids off the streets. 
Under the leadership of President David Reese, we bring the superstars of yesterday, today and tomorrow to your town. Not for a wrestling show, but an event that features action-packed in-ring wrestling, autograph, pose photo opportunities, Q&A sessions, and so much more. It's the best of sports and entertainment. The week of your event, we can add on to the endeavor with anti-bullying campaigns, library meet and greet reads, youth sport concussion seminars, and more. Our live events are fit for fans of any age from 5 to 95. This fall is part of our new Kids Club program. We offer live event experiences exclusively for the youngest of fans. On the flip side, we can produce a tailor-made event for fans of an older demographic as well. We work with you every step of the way to get the word out to fans near and far on our local television offerings and to over 50,000 fans and growing on our social media platforms. Your success is our success. If your group has had enough of candy bar and wrapping paper sales and has the energy to team with our passionate fan base, bringing the NWF experience to your community is the answer to put smiles on faces while raising cash for your cause. Contact us today to get the ball rolling for your custom-made event that you'll want to bring back year after year to your community. Don't just take it from us. Here are the folks we've teamed up with in the past.